right, everyone, let's do this. How's everyone doing? Welcome to this week's episode of our podcast, Is Breakfast Included? On the show today, we talk to TJ Hoffman. Now, TJ is a former tour manager, Backline Tech. He's worked for such bands as MOD, Agnostic Front, Ignite, and Skid Row. Um, He also put out a documentary a while back called Roadie, My Documentary. And it's really good, man. TJ did a great job. A lot of times when you see the word roadie in a movie or a documentary, they kind of make us look like buffoons. But he didn't do that. It's very real. He talked to actual roadies. They told their stories. He told his story, hence the name Roadie, My Documentary. You can watch this on Amazon Freebie. Check it out. Uh, you can find out more about it at roadyfilm.com. It was a lot of fun uh, meeting TJ and catching up with him. All right, let's check it out. Cool. Well, yeah, we'll talk about all that, man. So I usually just start to have you introduce yourself and then we go from there. So, okay. Yeah, TJ Hoffman, uh, producer, documentarian for Rody My Documentary. Where are you from? I was born in New Jersey. Uh, North Jersey, born in Englewood, uh, Bergen County, and um, grew up in uh, South Brunswick Township, which is right between Princeton University and Rutgers University. Okay. And uh, growing up, man, what did you want to do? It's it's crazy. I mean, I really had no ambition. So I was a skateboarder, BMX guy, bicycles all through high school. Uh, I went to a a private Catholic school, grammar school and high school. Played sports, did football, baseball, basketball, did all that stuff as a kid. Really had no ambition to do anything. Um, junior year in high school, started working, pumping gas, gas stations, cutting grass, yeah. shoveling snow. The normal stuff that kids did in the 70s and early 80s. And um, right there, junior year, senior year in high school, I hooked up with a friend of mine that was just doing some uh, installing windows and houses construction end. Mm-hmm. And kind of stuck with that, and I saw the money that could be made, and I I just kind of shifted everything towards working hard, making money. Um, you know, unlike the kids today in the eighties, uh, my mother said, "You want that car? You want this? You, you better save for it." Yeah. You, so we had to earn our keep. Yeah. You know, I turned eighteen; I was still living at home, but my mother had an empty jar on the countertop, and if I wanted to do laundry there. I had to put a dollar in the jar. Right, so on that end, that's what was my ambition to make, to make money. And then I kind of just stuck with construction ever since you know, until this day. Um, and then dabbled in a couple other little things. I went to audio engineering school, um, Sam Ash Music Institute, which isn't around anymore, and did some interning in the studio and that kind of stuff and thought I could get a career that way. And then I went on the road and the um, – the sporadicness of, yeah, let's go on tour for a month and then not have work for a month was tough. So I always went back to construction. So that's always been your fallback? Always. Yeah. And, you know, the company that I was with for 25 years, um, he was very empathetic to my, um, you know, my needs, Mm -hmm. more or less, quote unquote, needs to try and get into the music business. But also when I came back off the road, he he had a job for me and he let me work. Was that also a goal, the, the music business? I always thought that I could just hook up with the right person or the right band or the right something and stay in the business. Um, it just never worked out that way. Right on. When did the idea for this uh, documentary... By the way, you you have this documentary, Rody, my documentary. Uh, when did the idea for that? So It's been in the works for a long time. It has. It has. It actually, So I started writing a book in about 2004 six or so. And I had a friend of mine who was a producer in Los Angeles that was working on some MTV TV shows, called me up, knew I was writing this book. And um, he said, you know, put the book aside for a minute because this real, this new thing called reality TV is going to really be big. So let's work on doing a pitch for a reality TV show based on your book, based on roadies. Mm -hmm. So I did that. I put the book aside I started to actually film um, sketches, skits, kind of like the American Chopper, Paul Sr., Paul Jr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was me and my brother, who both my brothers were also roadies with me. Um, We were just doing funny skits, but based on real types of things that happen, you know, advancing a show, 
my brother not getting enough batteries for the tour, all these kind of s- silly things. Yeah. And um, pitched to Hollywood, and I, I hate using that term, but that's where all the that stuff happens. Yeah. Um, in the, in those years, um, a, a reality show. Right, um, pitching different options and th- th- different production companies. Didn't have a network yet. We pitched networks, but you know, like the Viacoms, the MTVs, they wanted to kind of make it really smutty and dirty. And I didn't want to go that route. No, I couldn't go that route because the biggest part of my pitch for the TV show was that I have all the connections. Like these guys that give me access trust me. Yeah. They trust me with the camera. So, you know, I'm, I'm I'm talking and I'm, we're backstage and we're setting up drums, you know, in drum world. And, and if I see something's going wrong and there's, it's uncomfortable for the tech or roadie, I'm going to pull back. Let's go to guitar world. Let's go to front of house. Let's go to catering. Let's, yeah. let's go to wardrobe. There's a hundred different places you can go to make it interesting. And, you know, we pitched being a fly on the wall. Um, we got permission from, from the, the bands, the management. They're roadies, and then then went up the ladder to um, record labels. I had record labels that were very interested in. Yeah, listen, I'll give you you know top top two of my touring bands right now, but you got to take two or three that are doing a van tour. Um, so it was a reality show. I was it, I was flying back and forth to L.A. We were trying to make it happen, and and when we got to a certain level and, and got got an option agreement with a production company. Um, Music and television from the legal side just collided head on. It was so hard for us to film this musician with this backline, but don't get this guy in the shot. And it was, yeah, it was, it was difficult to do that with no budget. So when you, until you actually get a network to sign on and give you $200,000 an episode, whatever, this was all on my dime. Yeah. Very difficult. Um, long story short, that the agreement they, they wanted to produce my show a different way than what I saw the vision, and I just bagged the whole thing. I stopped spending money, I stopped the bleeding, and I just put it to the side. Fast forward a couple of years, 2013. So I guess we pitched from 07 to 09, mm-hmm. 2010 around there. 2013, um, I was supposed to go on a tour with uh, some friends uh, from California at the Band Ignite. Mm-hmm. Um, I had blocked out like a, a week's um, vacation from work to, to go to Europe. Tour didn't happen. So Brett, the bass player, and I <clears throat> went to – we did a little, little R&R vacation. We did some snowboarding, some surfing, uh, some golf in Palm Springs. And during that week – uh, Brett really just kind of grabbed me around the neck and says, "What well, you have all this footage, you have all these things you've filmed, you have all these other interviews from the reality show. What, what are you doing with it? I said, I, I, I'm not sure. I haven't decided yet if I was going to go the route of a reality show again or not. He said, just make a documentary. Documentaries are starting to get really popular now. Put it out there. Take what you got. Put a trailer together. And let's pitch a documentary. So that's basically where it started. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Long and, story short. No. <laughs> and at that point, when you decided it was going to be a documentary, did you did you film more footage? Did you go start reaching out? Yeah. So put together, a, you know, an outline more or less. So documentaries, obviously, there's no script, so it can kind of go on either any way. But in order to kind of t- keep my budget in line, I had to build chapters and then film um and interview people based on the chapters right so we had 10 chapters and one's you know brotherhood roadie and then let me find out some of these guys that have been in the business long enough talk to new guys and then kind of did it that way and just yeah i just reached out to again my friends and peers in the business that i've worked with Mm -hmm. or that if they didn't want to be interviewed they would introduce me to people that did okay and, you know, I could really be doing interviews to this day. It just got an overwhelming response and people were very excited about what I was doing and were very open to the idea about it. 
as long as I wasn't going to portray the back lounge, you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Because there were people that my original trailer, um, and I'll send it to you by the way. I don't. It's not available anymore. Had a little bit of of uh, the sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Right, what everybody thinks happens on yeah. tour, and there were some of these people that were still working in the business. They were still actively touring. That didn't want to be affiliated with my film, thinking that was the route I was going to go. Yeah. But as far as interviewing and filming, I got a lot of support from the industry, from my friends and family, um, in in the touring business. Um, but I also got some resistance from the venues, the union halls. The Live Nations, the AEGs, you know. Yeah, you can film here. You know, I got the band's blessing, the management's blessing. I got everybody's blessing all the way up to the venue. And then they would say, no problem, $2,500 filming fee. You got to take this union guy with you to carry your camera bag. I'm like, I'm just doing this out of my pocket. Like, give me a break, man. I'm a, yeah. I'm a, I'm a young first-time filmmaker. So I had those challenges. Uh, but yeah, we kept filming until one day where I just said, we're done. Which was hard to do. Yeah. Because you always, yeah. I know that it, for me in this, this show, like when I'm on the road, like I have endless amount of people I can ask to do it. A lot of them say no, but a lot of them say yes. So were you like that when you were, did you, were you touring at the same time as you were filming or were you, were you done touring at that time? I was pretty much done touring. So... Yeah, so on and off. So I would do I would do some f- some fly dates uh, when I worked for Skid Row. I think the last th- years with them were oh nine ten, mm-hmm. maybe maybe up to twelve. Um, S- Snake's best friend Mike Thompson, who's another Jersey guy, built the recording studio with me. We were very tight. We had some stuff going on, and when Brett Perosi couldn't do some flyouts with Skids for whatever reason. I would take his spot and work that way part time. Yeah. Um, Ignite, I would do some stuff part time. I was doing some freelance work for a couple other production companies on the video end, uh, more or less stage management type of stuff. So, yeah. so touring days were over, but I was still in the business. Yeah. And the reason I try to keep as busy as much as I could in the business is to make those connections. Yeah. And I guess it's more of a selfish thing, um, just trying to network. Yeah. Around different gigs. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Some people would say, well, like, well, you know, if you had enough footage, why'd you, you know, why don't you just stop there? They don't get that whole, uh, no, 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 I could get something really good, you know, like, yeah. And it was, it was high end stuff. I was working for a production company here in Jersey and, and there was like a, a three day Alicia Keys shoot. And I got to be really close with, with the musical director for Alicia Keys and, and their techs and, and doing that stuff. And I was like, wow, if I can attach Alicia Keys to my film, that's just another notch in my belt to legitimize yeah. kind of what I was doing. That's yeah. why my friend Lindsay with Elton John, you know, we had to do a lot of, um, pre-production to present to Elton John's camp what we were doing to making sure we were portraying Lindsay in the right light. Yeah. Same thing. We didn't want to show the dark side and no. anything like that. But um, to, to have those different elements and different musical acts in the film, it, it just brought it full circle for me. So, yeah. so touring was over, but I still was trying to keep Alive in the business. Yeah. And like we sp- we spoke about earlier, I was trying to get out of the construction world. You know, as, as I say this all the time, as screwed up as the entertainment business is, I'd love to work in it. And then, you know, I'm working in construction. Like, thank God I'm not in that business. Now I'm in the construction industry on the developer, the real estate side of it, yeah. going, oh my God, this sucks. I, I want to go, go back to <laughs> music. You know, I just got off um, another week on Shiprocked where I'm part of the video, the audio video team. Uh, for filming and documenting all their stuff for socials, yeah, and that's just another great bridge to to keep in the business without being in the business. Yeah, I mean, a friend of mine's sense. a photographer on Shiprock, Chris uh, Bradshaw. Bradshaw, yeah, that's who I work for. Oh, right, Chris on, is my yeah. boss. Yeah, Chris. <laughs> Chris and I are really good friends. Oh, even okay. though his his last name slipped my mind. But yeah, Chris and I are really good that's, friends. That's uh, yeah, that's great. He's he's he took over that whole production on on photo video couple of years ago and i've been doing it with him steady ever since he's good people isn't he he's the best yeah the best and that's that's part of it everybody you know especially with that camp on that 
type of cruise environment. Um, it, they're just great people. Yeah. And that makes the job so much more pleasurable. They're not, you know, I even mentioned in the movie, they're not, they're not punishers. Yeah. So you can go work for a, a band or a, a company or whoever that you might be making good money. But if it's, if it's bad people and you can't get along with them and that you, your life's miserable, well, why are you, why are you doing it? I know. I, I, there was a, hu- there's a huge artist. Uh, I, I won't say his name, but a friend of mine works on that. He's been on that tour for a long time, but when I was back in Texas, I went to visit him and everyone on the crew had that thousand yard stare, like, you know, and they were only, you know, five shows in. It still exists. <laughs> yeah. I could, t- I could tell you this front hand within the last month, it still exists. <laughs> right. It's, uh, I want to go back to something you, you didn't want to portray like the dark side, the part side. It's funny because Brett Perosi is the first person in your documentary and he's like, you really want to know what that, what I do? I find some local guy to get me weed. <laughs> yeah, he's the best. He is the best. And he, you know, he brings that comedic element to the film. But at the end of the day, you know, it's such a long story how me and him got got connected. But so Charlie Mills was the very original original drummer for Skid Row uh-huh. before the first record. Yeah, um, some things happened. Rob Afuso joined the band, and that's that's the lineup that um, that's the drummer for the lineup that took off. Yeah, um, Charlie Mills came and was playing um, for D. Snyder's uh, SMFs at the time. Brett, Long Island guy, Bile worked for D. Did some stuff. And so through Charlie Mills, he hooked up the 2000 Skid Row Road Crew, which was me and Brett, mm-hmm. for the KISS tour um, in 2000. It was the farewell tour with yeah. Peter and Ace, original lineup. And it's so funny how, you know, we Brett and I collided in the beginning because he's just like, he's the easiest going, like whatever type of guy. Yeah. And I don't want to call him a stoner, but he's got that that mentality of just like, everything's okay, just relax. And I was really trying to be super pro. So I was tour managing it. I was Snake's guitar tech and doing Charlie's drums. And this is basically, it's not pre-cell phone, but it's it's pre-internet. So everything was, you know, Motel 6 books, Best Western books, getting hotels, trying to advance the one-offs and staying on top of the arena rock, which I was brand new to. Yeah. Um, my background was Europe and buses and festivals. Festivals, yeah. Real stuff. So it took me a couple of weeks to just realize, like, all right, this is, this is just Brett being Brett, and this is what I'm stuck with, and we just got to make the best of it. And then after a couple of weeks, um, we had a system built in, and he, he was the best. He's He's got a big heart. He loves music. He loves what he does. He's a hustler, man. And he, at the end of the day, he got the job done. So yeah. I had a, I learned a lot from him just backing off. Like, life's not that serious, man. Like, have fun. Yeah, yeah. You know? And when I asked him to be part of the movie, he, of course, anything you want. And yeah. then, you know, we filmed, when he was in LA, we, we did some filming um, for his band, uh, Creep, at the time, trying to promote him. And so it, was, it went back and forth. But uh, yeah. just another... Big heart, good soul, a beautiful person that that I would you know really bend over backwards for um, in this business. Yeah, he's a good dude. I, I, I several years ago, I I was going through some hard times, and I flew out to L.A. to visit a friend. And this is how good a friend Brett is. He picked me up at LAX. <laughs> Did he steal the car to pick you up? <laughs> no, no. Oh, okay. I think it was his girls that he was living with at the time. Yeah. This was several years ago, but yeah. That's how they, you know, if they're your friend, the if best. they come and pick you up at LAX. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I'm sure I can call Brett right now and ask him if he wants to be involved with something or do something for me. He would be there in a minute. Yeah. Yeah. He's a good dude. Yeah. Um, your, your touring story, you worked for, uh, some pretty, I mean, you worked for, uh, uh, Billy Milano. What was that like? <laughs> well, if anybody knows Billy Milano, um, <laughs> It was it was interesting. I, I he fired me a couple dozen times through the tour, the course of a, a tour. Um, so I was interning in a recording studio in, in South River, New Jersey, called Tracks East. Yeah, uh, the bass player that I worked for for years from a local band, American Angel, Steve Evitz, was the the um, engineer for the MOD Rhythm of Fear uh, record in nineteen ninety two. I was still drinking and drugging at the time. So I was going to school, 
Steve would call me up and say, come sit on the session. We're going over this today. I need you to clean two inch tape, whatever. Most of the time I went to take advantage of the, of the studio time. And this time I took advantage and it was, it was MOD recording and Billy and Dave Shavari was the drummer who's actually in El, El Nino now. Yeah. And the banter between Dave and, and Billy was, it was hilarious. It was, you know, your mother jokes, your sister jokes and, and back and forth. And it was, so it got to me, not only was I learning stuff through Steve in the studio, but I was having so much fun listening to these guys bust each other's balls and did the record um, and then Billy basically said, Hey, you know, oh, Steve Evitz played at the limelight for a mega force showcase. Um, in that 1992, right when the record was done, I guess promotion. And I, so I teched for Steve there a little bit. Well, I call it teching. I basically carried Steve's guitars, plugged some shit into the bass, you know, kept it in tune. Yeah. Um, so I was Steve's roadie. And then, you know, fast forward a couple months, Billy Milano would call me and said, Hey, look, we, you know, we, we know what you could do in the studio. You got a good grip for this. We, you know, we like what you did with Steve. Why don't you come to Europe with us? Like, okay. That was it. Like Europe. Yeah. It was, you know, 13 countries, and, uh, whatever, 20 something days. Like I'm in. And that was it. And I, so he had a studio in Hoboken where they rehearsed and that's where we packed everything up and shipped it rocket cargo to London, to the marquee. And started a month tour in Europe. And Billy is just very smart, talented musician. Um, very smart. Uh, uh, everything in the music business. Taught me a lot. Taught me a lot on both sides of the coin. Taught me a lot on how to how to manage, how to advance shows the right way. Don't let promoters take advantage of you. The clubs, if the rider's the rider. That whole side of it. Yeah. But also taught me a lot not what to do. Sometimes you don't need to treat people like you're going to, you know, choke the shit out of them and, <laughs> and, and, you know, kill their family. Um, but, but his aggressiveness and that New York, that New York, New Jersey mentality of get it done. This is a business. This is what we do kind of really set me in line. Okay. In the business. Yeah. And, and I, I thank him for that. I didn't, you know, without that opportunity, I probably know if I ever would have went on. A, a tour, you know, especially to Europe. And then when he started to manage Agnostic Front, Billy brought me in. I didn't know those guys at all. Yeah. So Billy brought me in the same studio in Hoboken and you got to come meet the guys. You're going to go work. They're going to Europe. You're going. Like, okay. Like I'm in, like I'm, this is what I do. Yeah. And I had, um, at the time I had bleach blonde hair, Air Jordans. I was still kind of a, like a drinking jock, you know, playing all adult sports and softball and all that stuff. Um, and here's Agnostic Front, you know, Dickies, Doc Martens, you know, really, really hardcore New York City streets, yeah. Lower East Side look. And I know Roger was like, what Billy, the what the fuck with this kid? <laughs> like, he doesn't fit with us, you know? And then there was some, not some animosity. Roger is very nice. Those guys were all good, but I'm sure in the beginning they were just couldn't figure it out. Yeah. And then when they we did a, the first show at the Wetlands, we, it was back-to-back -back shows Friday, Saturday at the Wetlands, New York City. I mean, it was the Victim and Pain uh, reunion lineup with Rob Kabul and Jimmy Coletti. Mm -hmm. And they haven't really done a big tour in a while. So when they started that, Wetlands was sold out two nights in a row. It it was like every typical hardcore show. There was there was no stage. There was no drum riser. It was just people everywhere. Everybody's hanging out. And it was diff difficult for me to try and be a tech and worry about guitars and tuning and really taking care of the instruments and having that hardcore thing going. Yeah. But after that weekend, I, you know, I proved myself that I wasn't going to take any shit and like, look, I got a job to do first and yeah, you're okay. You're, you're friends of the band. I get it, but you know, I, I got a job to do yeah. and I proved myself and, and the band was very you know open to that. Yeah. But Billy, Billy brought me into the, the, the live end of it. Um, you know, along with uh, Timmy McMurchie was the guitar player for that record as well. Timmy and I got to be close. Um, there was a toga party in upstate New York and and they brought me along for that. So th there was a, a lot of introduction into the the live music industry and the touring industry that Billy and, and Timmy put me into. Yeah. So I'm very thankful for that. And if a lot of people don't know Billy Milano, like that dude's a presence. 
You know, I, I used to play in a band called Mitra out of Dallas and Billy lived in Austin for a while and he was doing the front of house at a club called Red Seven. Mm-hmm. I wasn't even officially in the band yet. I just go in with them on this show to play. They, they were former members of a band called Speed Dealer. So they were a big deal, but we were going to Red Seven to play and, and, uh, Billy was front of house and, I was kind of nervous being around him because I'd been around him. He uh, played at a place called Galaxy Club where I used to work. And he was just, you know, he's intimidating. He is. You know, and I'm, I was a scrawny guy at the time, you know. Uh, and the first band played. A lot of people don't know how front of house works. There's a talkback mic up there. So the first band gets on stage and uh, they go into this progressive intro like guitar no vocals just like a musical intro it's like two minutes and then they go they stop and he gets on that talk back mic it's their first song right and he goes all right guys one more and puts it and they're just looking like and he's like i can't listen to that shit all night (laughs) yeah just one more song and you're done he's the best he and there's there's no filter with him um yeah i mean talk about a presence um you know, when he was managing Agnostic Front, to, you know, going in, into Europe, and there's actually some clips from, in my film. He did a song with AF um, at the Dynamo Festival, the uh, the open air Dynamo, not the club. And he would just walk into a room and nobody fuck with him. Yeah, you know, there was a couple of, couple of clubs I remember that they try to either short pay the band or not come through with something. And he started, you know, walked over to the, the soundboard and started taking the thing apart. And the guy, you know, these Germans, what what are you doing, Billy? I'm taking your board until you pay me. I want my money. And he would start taking the unplugging the board. He was going to put the console on the bus and he's going to take it. And then, oh, Billy, oh, it's okay. He, he would escort the guy to the Mac machine, take money out. I mean, true story. He's, um, again, taught me a lot. What just stand your ground? Yeah, and don't you know, especially in Europe, you know. Um, and th- I'm talking. This is the 1990s too. It's a little bit different nowadays, you yeah. know. But he was the he was the the broker slash promoter um, for the for the band. Speaking for the band, so you know, he had a a, a, a counter to it to click at the door. How somebody many people paid. Yeah, somebody had to do that. So you got you know you get a guaranteed number. And then there was, you split the door. So if there was, you know, t- over 200 people, you got whatever that was. A back end. 20 door yeah. marks, right. Yeah, yeah. And Billy constantly, he's like, I, I counted it right now, you know? And the guy's like, no, no, this is what I have. And he, you know, it, he stood his ground and proved a point and, and uh, very smart guy. And I'm, I'm, you know, again, very grateful for, for those guys. But yeah, pro- I can, we can have a whole separate podcast about <laughs> Billy stories, <laughs> right. you know, for sure. Uh, you uh, you said that that the the Skid Row tour was your introduction to arenas, but you were doing these huge festivals, and festivals in Europe are no joke. What was the what was the uh, what was there more pressure doing this tour with this the never ending farewell tour or these like Dynamo Festival? Yeah. So f- figure like those hardcore bands, right? You see BGBs, Wetlands, really tight small venues. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, Galaxy Dallas, you know, we played all those types of, of, of venues and then they would just grow a little bit. So then when you get to festivals, like some in Belgium, like Tells Bells is maybe 5,000 people, mm-hmm. you know? So there's, there's, again, this is before, you know, before Danny Wimmer with, with all the big festivals we have here, the Europeans really did it right. Yeah. They know it was just, everything was ran perfectly. The kids, it was a great, great time. So, the, you know, the introduction to a festival like Dynamo, where it's 100,000 people, or Lowlands, where it's 100,000 people, progressively, gradually came based on smaller festivals. But those were very, very, you know, open airs, mm-hmm. were very difficult because some were, um, you know, at night, cold. So the amps, the guitars, things were going out of tune from a technical level, very difficult, a lot of pressure. Yeah. The, the other side of it too, it's hardcore. You could be out of tune. No, and nobody gives a shit, right? It's hardcore. Right. And that was, that was Vinny Stigma's attitude for a lot of it, which was, which was great. Um, 
But the arena rock stuff, now I'm talking the year 2000, um, Skid Row with a new singer opening up for Ted Nugent and then Kiss the farewell tour with the original lineup. Yeah. So it's not just another arena tour. This Everything was sold out for the next four months. Yeah. Um, a, a lot of pressure. You know, 12 string acoustic guitars. Um, thank God Charlie was very empathetic to my position and helped me with the drums. There wasn't, you know, it wasn't really like so much. He would just wake up from the hotel and roll out and play drums. He, we all had a good, um, we had a good crew. Mm-hmm. But the pressure to to get the guitars right and to TM that tour, <clears throat> pardon me, on a professional level with other top professional TMs, um, a lot of pressure, you know, and I was still drinking at the time and, you know, Doc McGee managed Kiss and Skid Row and that's kind of how Skid Row got on that tour for the, the 40, the half hour, 40 minutes that they played opening, this opening slot. Um, we were the misfit kids on the tour. We always had the bottles and the drinking and, and mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. So I was engaging in that all the time. So trying to do that and maintain a professional type of level was really difficult. Yeah. Patrick Whitley was the production manager for, for that tour. Um, Robert, um, Robert Long was the stage manager. Robert Long is now the production manager for Motley and Kid Rock. I mean, he's really went up, really moved himself up in this business. And those two guys taught me a lot on the, on the TMing side. Whether they taught me a lot by telling me to go fuck myself and you're just an open and slot. Like, I don't know who you think you are, kid. Like, no, flat out tell me no. Or put their arm around me and say, hey, listen, this is how you navigate this. This is how you do that. This is how we're going to do it type of thing. Mm -hmm. So once I got into that little bit of of a momentum with the arena rock way, more or less, because nobody, there's no book. It's not like they said, okay, TJ, you're going to go on tour with Kiss and here's the arena rock thing. And this is how load-ins go. And this is when your bus has to be there. Like, I was just winging it. Like, we're at a club. Yeah. You know? And, you know, I've missed a couple sound checks. And and if you miss load-in, because your bus has to park not near the loading dock, we were the opening act, right? So if we had a bus in a trailer, and if we got there late and the union hands, the stage hands left, Brett and I are carrying all the road cases and everything from wherever the bus is parked into the arena, you know? So I, I learned a lot of tough lessons, um, but the pressure, it was tough. I mean, I did 130 something shows on that tour and as entertaining as the first one and the 137th ones watching Kiss play. Yeah. It was amazing. There's still that pressure that you have to, you know, be on top of your game. Yeah. And try to, <laughs> try don't get so fucked up that you can't do your job. Yeah. You know, do your job first, collect your money, make sure the gear gets on the bus, and then go get fucked up and be a mama Luke. Yeah. That was that was a lesson that I learned pretty quick as well. Right on, man. Uh what was the uh was there a catalyst or an incident that made you want to say, That's enough, man. I can't do that and do this. No. I I I, I strive on um hard impossible things. You know, one of the things that I've learned in the past making this film especially was if it excites me and scares the shit out of me at the same time, I'm going for it. <laughs> I need to have a hundred different things in a hundred different directions going on to make me thrive. Uh-huh. And I think that's part of my addictive personality as well. You know, I just didn't drink a glass of wine and, and have a beer and call it a night. Now, we went for the case of beer, the bottle of Jaeger, the bottle of Crown, you know, half a eight ball, half a hit of E, and I was off to the races for four days. I'm in a, like, let's do If we're going to do this, let's fucking do it. Yeah. So the challenge, and I never said no. It was, um, you have to do my drums. Piece of cake. You got to do Snake's guitar. Ah, it's easy. Once it's programmed, keep it in tune. Oh, and the 12 string in a cold arena or a hot outside shed. Yeah. And then you have to TM. Oh, and then the bus driver needs to get a, a hotel on 
um, on these nights where we're at the arena. And then our oh, days off, we, we're going to do a one-off at this club on the way. We have two days off in New Mexico and we need to do this. I, I just, you just do it. You're the only guy there. Well, I was with Brett. Mm -hmm. So technically I'm the only guy there, right? <laughs> um, for, as far as the TM siding side of that goes. But, it, you know, it's like my, uh, my friend Tom Weber, who, who's Eddie Van Halen's tech and he's out with Poison and stuff. You know, he said, we're the Marine Corps of the music business. You improvise, you adapt, you overcome, you, you find a way to get it done. Yeah. There's the, the trains coming to the station. It's not stopping. You better get the station ready. Yeah. And that was the end of it. Now I'm sure I could look back and probably count numerous times where I fucked up or I didn't get that done or I didn't do what the band wanted me to do at times. And there was a couple of moments where Snake definitely yelled at me. Scotty definitely yelled at me. Rachel definitely yelled at me on the Skid Row tour about the bus and that kind of stuff. But that's part of me just probably saying something stupid when I was drinking. Um, but I, I don't regret any of it because I think that just made me stronger and mm -hmm. built more character. Um Again, there was no like eventric touring system. There's nothing electronic. This was still, I was still writing, you know, show calls, you know, doors, dinner, yeah. sound check on a piece of paper, taping it to the bus in the dressing room. It was a, it was a lot easier world for a, a quote unquote roadie to get around. Now everything's so specialized where there's a tech, there's the TM's front of house and everything's digital and everybody can log into an app and see where they're at and that kind of stuff. And, you know, even the books. You know, where are we going tomorrow? Where are we yeah. playing Friday? You had, a, you had a book. You physically had to turn pages. The book of lies. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so I, I did fairly well. I got around a lot of those um, difficult situations multitasking. Yeah. You know, under pressure. Right on. You were telling me earlier about the, uh, you said you, you had, there was two ways you wanted the film to be looked at and then a small third. Could you tell me about that again? Yeah, so what I wanted to do originally was there was no documentaries out there um, on the national, on the, on the global level that really painted the picture about what roadies do, right? Nobody, nobody understands. And I learned a lot of that when people would say, you know, oh, you're a guitar technician. Like nobody knows what that is. Stan yeah. Lamondola in the film kind of pronunciated that a little bit better and went into it deeper. Um, so I just said, like, somebody's going to spend a hundred, one hundred fifty dollars on a ticket to a show. Let me do a real full circle documentary, thirty thousand foot aerial view, and paint the picture for that person. They mm -hmm. can really get it because these tours, it takes months and months of pre planning, and they start spending money months before they actually hit the stage. So I wanted to do that. I figured I could maybe do like a little Michael Moore type of investigative thing where I was maybe the host and I was introducing different scenarios backstage, this guy, that guy. Um, I wanted to paint that picture. And I also wanted to give props and kudos to the roadies that are out there that never get any accolades. Um, you know, before 20 feet from stardom dock and before hired gun dock, mm -hmm. you know, the, the roadies were, those people were not really glamorized, right? It's, it's the rock star. It's, it's the person at the front of the stage um, that gets all the attention and makes all the money. So I wanted to give some props to these guys that, you know, they've been in the business 20, 30 years full time, their whole life, you know, dedicating their life to making that rock star be a rock star and not really getting the praise and props. Now, most of them, 80, 90% that I met, they don't want that praise. That's their job. That's what they do. They don't want to, you know, thank you, but I don't need that. Yeah. And then you got the 10% like Brett, like, <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll take it. Yeah. You know, I'll take it. So I wanted to do that as well, you know, yeah. and it took a lot of turns making the film based on the footage that I had, the money that I had left, the footage that I, I needed to get or could and couldn't get. And this is, this, this film is the best thing that I, I could produce at the time. And I just had to call yeah. it a day and that's it. All right on. It's a great, it's a great documentary. Like I told you, I watched it three times. Um, and I'll probably continue to watch it whenever I can, because most of the uh, depictions of a roadie or a guitar tech or a tech, you know, there's that whole roadie versus tech and that's fine. Um, they kind of depict this as buffoons, 
the songs written about the roadies or, you know, you watch this show roadies and they depict them as like, we're a bunch of, you know, monkeys fucking a football backstage, you know, and, but your, your documentary actually gave us a voice. That's what I liked about it. You know? And like I said, I got into this business late. I didn't know what the fuck I was doing. I was fortunate enough to run into a, a, a bunch of cats that took me under their wing and said, buy these tools. These tools will get you through everything. Do this. Don't do that. You know, like the first guy I teched for was a, a tone head. So he taught me about tone and, and, you know, he heard shit nobody else hears. And he taught me how to listen for things. So I, I really appreciated the way you, the way you made this movie, you know, and, and everyone in it. I knew some people in it too, which was kind of cool. Brett, yeah. like I said, I, I don't think you could have opened with a better, <laughs> a better scene. Than- I had to. Once he, once he said that, I had to do it. Yeah. But, you know, if you watch like in the, I don't even know the year. I think it was the seventies. Meatloaf was in a movie called Roadie. Yeah, I right? remember. So talk about, you know, a meathead. Uh, that guy just was that. He was more security bouncer type of roadie. Yeah. That's what they did. They moved stuff. Yeah. Um, that doesn't exist anymore. Those those guys that just move ca- and that's how I started, just moving cabinets. You know, yeah. come help us move these cabinets up the stairs and set up, and you know, you drink for free and that kind of that kind of thing. That's how I got into this whole thing. Yeah. In the very very beginning, but I those guys don't exist. Those you know, the guys, there's stagehands that, that work locally that move gear and unload trucks, yeah. of course. And I'm sure you have the, the occasional roadie that that's just drives the van or the trailer, the bus, whatever, that'll do that for some bands too. But yeah. for the most part, they're specialized technicians that are sometimes better musicians than the guy they're teching for. And that's yeah. mentioned in the movie as well. Um, they can do my job, but I can't do theirs. That's a great line, you yeah. know, which I... Sometimes I, I agree with that. <laughs> but, yeah. you know, there was a, I don't know if you ever visited a club called The Basement in Dallas. I don't recall, but that's yeah. not to say that I haven't been yeah. there. Yeah, it was a, it was a, it was the, it was the venue I used to go to when I was 16, 17 years old to see all the local bands and sometimes the national acts would come through there. But whenever the, I found out through a guy I met there and he said, if you show up on show day, when a national act is coming through and just hang out, they'll let you load their gear in. <laughs> and so we would show up and just hang out there and they'd back up that trailer and we'd say, you guys need any help? And they, we'd be in there bringing their amps in. They'd give us a couple of guitar picks. That's it. Yeah. But we got to see the show, right. you know, and help these, you know, it, it was cool. And I didn't know then that I was going to end up doing this for a living. I didn't know in... 2006, right before I started doing this, that I was going to do this for a living. I've done every job, you know, under the sun. But I, uh, this this whole roadie business changed my life, you know, for Me the too. better. You know? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and do you miss it? I do. Uh, at times, yeah. I do. <clears throat> when, I, when, I, when I get off the tour bus, I'm like, oh, I can't wait to go to sleep not moving. Mm-hmm. Right, that kind of thing, and 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 I think Brett said it too. He, the grass is always greener somewhere else, right? When you're on the road, you want to be home. When you're home, you want to be on the road. Yeah, I do miss um, the camaraderie. I do miss my friends, even in other countries that I haven't seen since touring. Um, I miss the the sense of pride that one gets, and I guess I'm, I can only speak for myself because I'm not really a musician. Right. So I can get around tuning and play and programming and that kind of stuff. I know enough to get around it. But, and I'll use Snake an example with his, his 12 string um, on the, on that Kiss tour in the Arena Rock, where some of these arenas is, you know, maybe a third full and it's really cold. So the guitar tuning was always in and out. But to watch an arena go from just, just a, just an arena, sometimes an ice and then new deck and watch the stage being built and the whole thing being done and, the gear and making that sound come through that little wire and out yeah. the speakers and watching the crowd react like this is the best time of my life. I'm having it right now. Yeah, Snakes feeding off their energy. They're feeding off snakes energy. It's, 
it's um it's a little sense of pride that you get that you had a little piece of making that happen. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then you can break it down, pack it up, and try and you know, duplicate the same exact thing in a different city or town or country the yeah. next day. So I miss that sense of accomplishment, sense yeah. of pride. You know, I, I just went through it on on um, on Ship Rock on on Chris's team on the video end. Um, it, it's a demanding type of job, a little bit different than a roadie, but it's a it's a it's in that live entertainment business. Uh, you have to be a fly on the wall type of thing, and there's things that go with it that I don't think anybody would just walk into and and learn how to do. But the the scent the 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 fact of going into that every year, knowing what you have to do. Watching the whole thing come up, come down, successful, you know, um, that sense of pride sticks with a person. Yeah. And that's, I, I miss that sometimes. Yeah. And what don't you miss? Fuck, what don't I miss? I don't miss like <laughs> cold whitefish and salami and, and, a, and a German loading food at a German club. Right. You know, I, I don't miss some of the travel. I don't miss border crossings with convicted felons in, in, I don't know. Listen, that, you know that doesn't sound all that unglamorous, but it's it was part of the job, and and yeah. I don't regret any of it. I, I, I everything that I that I did, whether it was bad or no good, was was all for a reason. Yeah. Um. I, I think I miss it more than I don't. But I, you know, I have my I have two kids here. Um. Uh, my my youngest one's fifteen and is a sophomore in high school, and um he lives with his mother in Pennsylvania, but. I, I need to be here. Yeah. I can't these these stages of his life, I, I need to be here for them. And uh I'm engaged, I'm with the girl for ten years. Um I, I need to be here, you know, for her. Yeah. Um wh- would I do it again short term? Uh, probably in a minute. Like yeah. if Ignite called me and says, Look, we need you for a week. We're doing a little festival run, but we have two days off in Amsterdam, two days off in Budapest. Come on, like old times, let's go. I'm in. Yeah. Uh, I'm in, you know. Yeah. Where can they find the movie? So the biggest platform right now, it's on Amazon uh, Freebie. If you just search Amazon, it'll pop up. But I think it's still on Tubi and a couple other small ones. Um, it's out there. Yeah. Um, I was really kind of shocked that it went to my, my distributor, put it on Freebie a little bit quicker than I wanted it to go because I was yeah. trying to recoup some money. Yeah. Um, but what it's, what it's done for me was – um, people are seeing it and yeah. they're watching it. And I've got, I got recognized actually on ship a couple of times that, Oh, you're that guy. And a guy came, approached me and said that he was teaching a, a school in Grand Rapids, Michigan and showed his class, my film. Um, because not every kid can be a musician. Not every kid can do that guitar riff or play the drums like Tommy Lee, where they can be in a band and make it. Yeah. But there's other avenues that you can make it to be in the music business, being a roadie or an accountant or um, in merchandise or, or something. Yeah. Um, so that that's that's a little sense of, of pride. I'll never recoup the money that I put into it. Yeah. But what I am getting is some accolades um, of, hey, I saw your movie and I enjoyed it. And yeah. that's, to me, that's that's gold. I know, right? You know, you can't, you can't be, t- and don't get me wrong. I'd love to get the money and recoup <laughs> it, you know? Um, but it's, it's just nice to be, it's just nice to be noticed and that it's, it's well, uh, received and not just, you put it that movie and I'm going to, if I see, I'm going to break your neck. Yeah. Like I, I didn't get any of those yet. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, any plans for another documentary ever? It's funny. I, so part of, of, of this being on Amazon and people are seeing it, I am being approached to be involved, whether it's co-produce or write or get involved with some other um projects mm-hmm. um too premature to really announce right now yeah but i i hope to do another one um with the right people again no punishers um but if i have the right group of people on the right team i'd love to do another one it's right on fun. man you know you 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 know just like i do you if you love what you do it's not work right I wouldn't still be doing it. Like, you know, I've walked on one gig in my entire career, but everyone else, you know, I've been I've been very fortunate to work with, you know, some of my heroes. Yeah. It's nice. It is. Know? It is. You know. 
and I don't get starstruck and, and I don't get, um, you know, like, Oh my God, there he is, you know, and I've seen a lot of that, especially on the kiss tour. And, and I remember being in second grade and putting the makeup on and doing that whole thing. And, and, um, but to be around the element of that, maybe somebody is going to be at this show. And, you know, we played the marquee in London with, with MOD 1992 or three. I don't remember. And, you know, I'm telling this guy to get that fuck out of my way. Cause you're in the way I got to get to the dressing room. And it was, Paul Deano from Iron Maiden. I didn't know it. You know, it's, dude, just get out of my way. Like, I got a job to do. Because I didn't want Billy to yell at me. Either. Yeah, yeah. And then at the end of the day, it was like, oh, sir, I'm so sorry. Like, I'm really a fan. And it's like, ah, don't worry. It's fine. And then you start drinking and it's good. But, um, yeah, that, that kind of stuff, become it becomes a, an, um, I don't want to call it a thankless job, but it, it becomes a um, part of the, a part of your pay. Is when yeah. people, you yeah, know, are around that environment. Yeah, that you meet. It's great. Yeah, you know Matt from your, um, the documentary Matt Varley. Yes, uh, I took a last minute gig with him when he was TMing six a.m. Oh, right. And uh, I was looking at a friend of mine called and said you available. Blah, blah blah. They're doing this private show in Dallas, and I was looking after DJ Ashba, and. But, you know, Motley Crue's, they were my posters on the wall, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so I'm there for the rehearsal day, and Nikki walks in, and he he walks in, and he, he introduces himself and thanks me for coming on such short notice, but he's like, hi, I'm Nikki, and I'm like, oh, hey, I'm Bernie, and in my head is like, I know who the fuck you are, yeah, dude. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He uh, and so that those times like that to me are worth what I like. I would never be in that position to to meet this cat that you know. Yeah, and and to give Nikki credit, he always has done that. Yeah. Um, even when the the skids guys that I work for um were in other projects and we played with them, always very personal, always almost part of the crew. Yeah, but, but yeah, those guys that goes a long way. Yeah, with with just us little roadie guys, right? I know, right? <laughs> yeah, because it's it does it goes a long way. Man, this podcast is called "Is Breakfast Included?" We were having breakfast, TJ. What would you have? What would I have? Yeah. So these days, I am ninety percent, ninety five percent plant based. Okay. Um, so I'm doing a lot of granola and oatmeal, um, and shakes. Right on, man. The days of Pork roll, egg, and cheese on a hard <laughs> roll are over right now, but yeah, um, I'm kind of go trying to go plants just for a little change of pace. Right on. I love pork roll. I didn't have pork roll till I moved here. <laughs> I'm 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 sold. <laughs> now remember, from like basically the Princeton area north, it's pork roll. Princeton area south, Taylor ham. Taylor ham. <laughs> Fuck Taylor ham. It's pork roll. We're in North Jersey, right? <laughs> Right on, man. Well, thank you, man, for doing this. I appreciate you taking the time. We tried to do it a couple of times, and yeah, I'm, I apologize up and down. Like, no just worries, man. No worries. I know you're busy. I'm sitting at home just waiting to go out on the yeah. road. But I know you got it. Yeah. Well, listen, I want to thank you for doing this kind of stuff and to spread the word, um, not only for my film but with other roadies and techs to keep it going, yeah. keep the keep the train moving, and and let the um, let the the people that go to a concerts really understand, you know, what this career is all about yeah. and that it's, it's not just being next to the rock star, you know, you're away from home and you're, you're missing events and you're missing your kids and yeah. relationships. So I, I thank you for that. And, and uh, thank you for, for yeah. this. There, there's, it takes a certain kind of person to do this. It does. Yeah. And thank you for what you do. Well, thank you, man. Thanks Appreciate for having it. me. Excellent. Good to talk to you. You too. Thank you. There you go. TJ Hoffman. Great guy, like I said, man, we've kept in touch ever since uh, this interview, so I would call us friends. Uh, check it out if you want to know more about it, roadiefilm.com, roadiefilm underscore TJ on Instagram, Amazon Freebie. Go check it out. Support these independent artists like myself. We put our own time, our own money into this, and we get very little back other than the satisfaction that you're listening or you're watching. Um, so go do it, man. Support, support, support. On that note, go subscribe to our podcast. Follow the social media on Instagram, Facebook, Is Breakfast Included? Uh, 
Like I said, it may not mean much to you, but it means the world to us. Check it out. Subscribe. Leave a review, good or bad. I mean, you know, we'll take it all. All right, guys, I'm done. Have a great day. We'll talk to you next week.